You may recognize the name, um, Dr. Weintraub. He's been on our programs before. He is probably one of the foremost uh, voices for non-motor symptom uh, research and management um, in the movement disorder space. Um, he is a board certified geriatric psychiatrist and professor at the University of Pennsylvania. He's a PD expert and his research includes the psychiatric and cognitive complications of Parkinson's. And today he's going to be talking about some new data. And I know this is something that we're all very much interested in. So I'm going to pass this over to Dr. Weintraub. Thank you, Anissa. You can hear me okay, everyone? Okay. Um, hello, everyone. Good morning and afternoon, I guess, to most people, um, or evening if anybody's further away. Um, I'm going to share some slides now, and I'll rely on someone, maybe Anissa, to tell me if I'm doing this correctly. Um, and then I'll give a brief introduction. Uh, share screen, and I'm going to share this screen. And does that look good so far? Yep, you are good. It okay. is showing your, um, it's not in presentation mode, but we can see it. And does that look better now? Perfect. Okay. Um, all right. So let's see if I can pull this over here so it's not blocking me. Okay. Um, so hello again to everyone, and this talk focuses on cognition um, with a little bit of um, kind of background and introduction. I just wanted to introduce the topic and then go into some of the um, more recent data, current data that Anissa referred to. Um, this has been presented at a couple of meetings now. It has a manuscript that's under um, resubmission, so hopefully this will be published data soon in a journal. Um, and I will say this is um, an exciting time to be involved in this field. As many of you are probably aware, there's been um, a lot of recent developments focusing on the biological um, aspects of Parkinson's disease, including a proposal or proposals for even a biological definition um, that focuses more on identification of synuclein disease um, through um, cerebrospinal fluid or perhaps even potentially other tissues like blood and um, skin. And this has also led to a kind of a reconceptualization of the staging of Parkinson's disease based on certain clinical markers um, and symptoms. And there was just an article published, um, and I don't know if you'll have a chance to share with the group, but the um, Lancet Neurology papers that came out, there's actually been two series that I can alert people to. One came out in Lancet, it's so a kind of the parent journal. Um, there was an overview of Parkinson's disease, and that included um, three papers, one on um, epidemiology, one on biological mechanisms of Parkinson's, and one on clinical management. And then after that, just yesterday or two days ago now, um, there was this, a couple of papers and then some accompanying editorials published in Lancet Neurology. And one was um, that I had to be a part of is really talking about what I just mentioned, this biological definition and staging of Parkinson's disease. It's a proposal for research purposes. And why am I going to all the length to tell you this? Well, it's because it's relevant to this topic. This new biological definition and, and staging really allows non-motor features to be on a par with the motor features of Parkinson's disease. So somebody, as long as they have the biology of Parkinson's disease, and that means synuclein and some evidence for dopamine deficiency, for instance, a dopamine transporter or DAT scan, that person can meet the definition of the disease um, on the basis of having motor symptoms, but also cognitive symptoms or other non-motor symptoms, which we know are um, common in Parkinson's disease, like sleep disturbances or smell impairment. Um, so I, that's a way of saying that cognition is becoming even more recognized and important um, to understand in the context of Parkinson's disease. All right, so here we go. 
now I just have to figure out how to advance the slides. Um, okay, that worked. So there's a lot of research going on, and I just wanted to highlight a little bit of it, and I'll tend to highlight things I'm involved with because that's what I know the best. Um, there's more of a focus on getting patients involved or also informants involved in terms of reporting on a range of symptoms, including cognitive symptoms, um, because it's easier to get people to report things um, than to actually test them um, cognitively. Um, so just asking people if they've noticed change in their thinking abilities. And I, I refer back to an article, and I don't know if anyone on the call has read this before. It's now maybe 15 years old. And um, I happen to see it because my wife reads The New Yorker, and she tells me when she comes across something of interest, and this came out of The New Yorker. Um, but Michael Kinsley, some of you may be familiar with his name, um, a very impressive person in many ways. And I just listed a few of his achievements to just demonstrate that he's, you know, highly educated, very accomplished person, a journalist, a political journalist. And, um, but he had Parkinson's disease or has Parkinson's disease. And I remember meeting him. Um, he knew colleagues here at Penn. And in this article, he, he talked about cognition. He talked about it in person, but he also wrote about it in the article. And I thought it was interesting what he had to say. And I'll just read the the quote from the article or, or the text. I knew that thinking was involved. I asked my neurologist at the time and he answered carefully. Well, after a few years, you may lose your edge. Lose my edge, lose my edge. Oh, and I believe um, blocked out the expletive. I need my edge. My age, edge is how I make a living. More than that, my edge is my claim on the world. It's why people are my friends, why they invite me over for dinner, perhaps why they marry me. What am I worth to the world if I've lost my edge? And this article that he wrote was probably, I don't know, five to 10,000 words long, and it was beautifully written. And you would never know that he had any cognitive impairment based on what he had written in the article, but yet he identified in himself that there had been some changes that had occurred. So that's the patient perspective in part. Um, we've also had a chance to look at the University of Pennsylvania with our, what we call our clinical core cohort, where we follow currently about 150 um, Parkinson's disease research participants, and they get um, regular uh, cognitive testing either every year or every other year. And we do what's called a consensus diagnosis, where we assign them based on their performance and other outcomes um, or other assessments whether they have normal cognition, mild cognitive impairment, or they may have cognitive impairment that's risen to the level of what we call dementia, so more severe um, cognitive impairment. And that we asked people a cognitive complaint, just a very simple question. Do you feel like you've experienced cognitive changes over time? And what we found was that the left-hand side just shows those with and without a cognitive complaint at the time of the diagnosis um, and who had normal cognition by our consensus diagnosis and showing they didn't really clearly demonstrate much in the way of cognitive changes. That's all the test on the left. But what we found out was that over time, by following them, those who um, had a cognitive complaint at baseline were more likely to develop cognitive impairment over time, over these subsequent years. So it shows that there seems to be value in just asking patients whether they've noticed cognitive changes or not, even if they're objectively normal at the time you're asking them that question. And this is even more recent data. Um, this paper was just accepted for publication in Movement Disorders Journal. So it should be out fairly soon. And some of you may have actually been involved in this study. Um, it's called PD-PROP and um, PROP stands for Patient Report of Problems, and it's part of the Fox Insight Study through the Michael J. Fox Foundation for Parkinson's Research. And they also ask in a different way, um, in this online reporting, for patients to list their five most bothersome problems with Parkinson's disease. And not surprisingly, um, cognitive complaint or cognitive problems are reported not uncommonly. So what we did was we took that data, this is from over 20,000 participants in total, and we looked at those patients who had any cognitive complaint 
and normal cognitive functioning using an instrument um, called the PDAC-15. So they were able to function normally cognitively by their um, assess report, um, but had a cognitive complaint and followed, looked at their data over several years and found that those people who had a cognitive complaint at baseline were more likely to develop cognitive functional impairment over time. So that's um, impairment in daily activities um, related to cognition. So again, showing the prognostic significance. And on the left, I think the other thing that's helpful is to look at at the left is what are some of the symptoms that are reported and how do we categorize them? Um, so cognitive slowing, executive abilities, so that's the ability to um, carry out, plan and carry out um, cognitive tasks, concentration or attention, which is commonly reported even in early Parkinson's disease issues, memory, language word finding problems, mental alertness or awareness, and visual spatial abilities, which are the abilities, the ability to manage um, things in three-dimensional space, like would be required for driving, for instance, depth perception and and the and the like. So these are some of the common ways we categorize cognitive abilities in Parkinson's disease. All right, so what do we know about cognition actually in the course of Parkinson's disease? So we know that it can be um, impaired very early in the disease process. So I, I was talking about disease definition um, before. More and more, there's a focus on early disease. Um, people who haven't even been formally diagnosed with Parkinson's disease on the basis of motor symptoms, but have um, evidence for the disease in other ways. And this was one study called the PAR study, which recruited people with impaired smell based on a smell test called the UPSET, and then gave them a dopamine transporter scan, this dope, this STAT scan that I mentioned before, that's helpful for diagnosing Parkinson's disease. And what I'm showing you on the next slide is the performance, the cognitive performance of those people who had impaired smell and a DAT deficit, so impaired dopamine transporter imaging, but had not been diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. These are just people in the general population. And what it shows, um, and I'll just tell you without you having to worry about the numbers, is that in many different cognitive domains, global cognition, um, what I mentioned is executive abilities before, memory, attention, you could detect cognitive differences um, where those who had this smell impairment and that deficit scored worse than those that did not have those features. And a similar story has been reported for probably the most common prodromal Parkinson's disorder. It's also a prodromal disorder for dementia with Lewy bodies, and that's idiopathic or isolated RBD, RBD stands for Rapid Eye Movement Sleep Behavior Disorder. And that's the disorder where patients um, are able to physically and verbally act out their dreams. It's often identified by a bed partner. Um, and it's common in Parkinson's disease, but it's also common in what we call prodromal or at-risk Parkinson's disease. And there you can also detect um, cognitive differences between those with RBD and those without RBD before they've ever been diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. And then finally, I wanted to let you know, I mentioned a little bit about this um, disease definition using what's called the synuclein seed amplification assay. So that's a biological way to detect synuclein in the cerebrospinal fluid. And this is study from a Swedish group just published um, last year so within the past six months, showing that those people in the general population, these are people without any neurological condition, who have the synuclein detected in their cerebrospinal fluid, it was about 8% of healthy controls, had more cognitive decline over a 10-year period than people without that. If they had evidence for also Alzheimer's disease biomarkers, um, that was it, the most rapid decline in cognition overall. So it shows that um, even in people without any evidence of disease, if you uh, without any evidence of clinical symptoms, if you have evidence of the disease, um, that there seems to be some association with early cognitive changes. All right, so this is really just building the case for the importance of cognition 
throughout the course of disease. Um, once somebody is diagnosed with Parkinson's disease, what have we learned over the years? What we've learned a couple of things is that mild cognitive and changes can occur in about 25 to 30 percent of people without significant cognitive impairment. So even if you take out those who have dementia, what we call milder cognitive and changes or MCI occurs in about a quarter to 30 percent of patients. And we've also learned that these cognitive changes can occur um, variably and broadly. So all the five common domains that are listed there can show impairment in Parkinson's disease, which is really different than Alzheimer's disease, which at least early on tends to focus more on memory and language skills. Um, all right. So what about dementia? So now we're typically, when we're talking about dementia in Parkinson's disease anyway, we're really talking about later stage disease, people that are older, people that have had the illness for longer. Um, and there's a couple of um, commonly held beliefs, I would say, um, that are based on somewhat limited data, which really spurred us to conduct these additional analyses or new analyses that I'm going to show you. So these are probably the two most pivotal studies that have, are often cited, which leads one to believe that dementia in Parkinson's is really inevitable or near inevitable. So the one on the left was from a Norwegian cohort that showed an eight-year prevalence rate of dementia and Parkinson's disease of 78%. And if you look at the data, or I'll, I'll just tell you what the data shows, um, the average duration of illness in that cohort um, was at the time of um, the 78% was about 15 years. So that study suggested that by 15 years into the illness, about 80% of people would experience dementia. The study on the right um, was conducted in Australia, in Sydney, Australia, and was a small study. Both of these studies are relatively small, but this one was even smaller. And that showed that if you followed people out to 20 years of illness duration, that nearly all of them, this is what's called a survival curve. And you can see that it gets close to zero. The y-axis gets close to zero by the time you get out to 20 years, which is on the x-axis, meaning that almost everyone has become, who was left had become um, demented or had become demented before that time point. So that's often cited and um, where the kind of, there's been many other research articles, but most of them are kind of um, similar to this or, but, but the ones that have really looked long-term, these are the two most cited ones. Um, uh, one other point I wanted to make about this, though, is if you just look at the publication dates at the bottom there, 2003 and 2008, these studies were conducted quite some time ago. So they have limitations, which I'm not going to go through all of them now, but they're smaller sample sizes, single sites, um, almost you know 15 to 20 years old now. So um, it's time to maybe take a fresher look. So I'm going to present you data from two cohorts. One is the one where um, I work day to day at the University of Pennsylvania that's part of a larger research study. It used to be called a Udall Center. Some of you are familiar with that term. Then it, it morphed into what's called an um, NIA, National Institute of Aging U19 study. Um, Regardless of what the name is, we've been following um, up over 400 Parkinson's disease patients for the past um, close to 20 years now, um, currently following about 150. So this is the source of the data for this Pennsylvania cohort, Penn cohort. So on this um, figure from um, the paper, um, I just highlighted in the box the Penn cohort in the red box, it's 389 participants, and there's a whole listing of variables there that I don't need to go through in detail. Um, but I do wanna just mention that at each visit, which is either every year or every other year I mentioned, participants are administered a detailed cognitive battery. I won't go through all the tests, but some of them are global tests that you would have been familiar with, like the, the MOCA, the Montreal Cognitive Assessment, and then also some um, more detailed um, cognitive test. Um, for each participant, we have a team that reviews the cognitive test results, questionnaires about function, clinical impression, 
And then we assign this diagnosis that I said of normal cognition, MCI, or dementia at every visit. Um, at baseline, um, for this study, it's a convenient sample of participants. The PD duration, the disease duration was about six years, and participants had a uh, about close to five follow-up visits on average after baseline. All right. So this is the actual numbers I'm going to show you now. This is a table that's showing the um, the dementia diagnosis probability by five-year blocks in the um, five-year blocks of disease duration within the Penn cohort. And I just highlighted one in the middle, which was that by year 15, we get about 50% of the participants in our cohort that would have a diagnosis of dementia at that time point. And remember, one of the studies I cited previously had reported 80% by year 15. So this is, um, to me, significantly lower. Now, once you get out to year 20, year 25, you can see the rates do get high, the sample size gets smaller. But I also want to note that by year 20 or 25, um, these patients in our cohort would be in their mid 80s. And um, the rates of dementia in the general population get fairly high by the time you reach that age anyway, because of you can develop Alzheimer's disease, you can develop um, cognitive changes from strokes or other what we call blood vessel disease. So it's not like only Parkinson's disease is happening to people by the time they get into their mid 80s. Um, this is another way of presenting the data that I just showed, which is the survival curve again. And this shows, if you look at the x-axis where I put the vertical red line, that's 15 years since Parkinson's diagnosis. And if you look at the horizontal red line that meets it, that's a 50% survival probability. So at 15 years, the survival, survival being dementia survival is 50%, which is the same um, way, the same numbers that I just presented on the last slide. It's just a way of showing it more visually here. And that's just confirming it with text. Um, so our cohort was large enough or had enough people um, develop dementia over time that we were able to look at certain categories, subcategories. Um, so one was age at Parkinson's diagnosis. And here you see, um, not surprising, but kind of striking differences. Um, so the left-hand columns are those who were diagnosed at less than 56 years, um, the middle columns, those who were diagnosed between ages of 56 and 69, which is kind of the average duration, uh, average age of diagnosis. And then on the right, those who were diagnosed after age 70, which is older age. And you can see that if the older you are when you're diagnosed, the much more likely you are going to be um, demented or have dementia um, by year 15. So those who have young onset Parkinson's, it's less, it's about 20% um, at year 15. So you can really see those patients tend to have a milder course. And um, also, again, I've already said this once, but I'll say it again. If you have your onset of Parkinson's after 70 years, you're much more at risk of having other things going on besides Parkinson's disease. So Alzheimer's disease, pathology, blood vessel disease, and so on. Another category was um, commonly reported to having differences, although somewhat controversial or variable, is sex. And this is showing something that has been reported and was pretty clear in our sample anyway, was that if you are a male, there's a higher likelihood that you'll have dementia. Again, I'm focusing on the year 15 point for this cohort than if you're a female. Okay. And then finally, by education level, which has also been reported before and is true for dementia in general, that those people with higher education, that's the right-hand columns here being age uh, years, 13 or more years of um, education. So that typically means some college or more or less than 13 years of education. So high school education or less, those with higher education levels are less likely to have dementia. All right, and so that's one data set I wanted to present. Here's another data set. Um, some of you may be familiar with this. Some of you may be, even have participated in it. So this is the well-known 
Michael J. Fox Foundation for Parkinson's Research PPMI study or the Parkinson's Progression Markers Initiative study. And here I'm going to present some of the basics. Now I'm on the left hand side of this table. Um, also a relatively large cohort, about 400 patients. And um, there's some of the characteristics. Now, the one main difference to highlight right up front for the PPMI cohort is that they're recruited as having a disease onset. So newly diagnosed, untreated, which is different than what our cohort was at baseline. Um, and they also are assigned a cognitive diagnosis. Um, that's done by the site investigator at each site every year, same thing, normal cognition, MCI or dementia. And they're given a document about how to assess cognitive change, to maybe look at cognitive test scores and interpret them, um, functional impairment. That has a similar battery or cognitive battery that I, I would say um, to what we have in our PEN cohort that I just showed you, including the global instrument, the MOCA, but also some of the detailed tests as well. All right, so now I'm gonna show you the comparable data for the PPMI cohort. So the left-hand side of this table is the site investigator diagnosis, which is kind of the equivalent for the PPMI study to the consensus diagnosis I showed you before. And you can see here that if you go all the way to the bottom, we could only go out to year 10 because the PPMI study has only been running for about 10 years. The rates of dementia were about 10%. So much lower than what had been reported in other studies, uh, much lower than what I've reported in the Penn cohort. Um, and we can talk about potential reasons for that later. But um, And then we were curious, well, maybe that's just because the site investigator doesn't diagnose it for some reason or see it. So we also had the MOCA as a proxy and the UPDRS part one score. It's another assessment um, a, a very simple one question about significant cognitive impairment. And those numbers at year 10 were pretty similar. Um, they went from like 10 to 15%, but still quite low using these altern alternative definitions or alternate. And here's the equivalent Kaplan-Meier survival curve out to 10 years, because really the numbers are only sufficient out to 10 years to make a meaningful statement. But you can see there how close the survival is to 100%. It's only 10% um, that have developed dementia by 10 years of diagnosis. Um, there we weren't, because the numbers of dementia cases were so low, we couldn't look at things like um, age of onset, uh, sex, education. But the one advantage that the PPMI study has compared with our PEN cohort is that it has a healthy control cohort. So there's about 200 participants who are um, comparable in other ways to Parkinson's disease patients, um, but don't um, have Parkinson's disease and are also followed in the same way. And you can see at baseline, their um, MOCA scores, that's the global cognitive instrument I mentioned, was pretty similar, about 28 um, and um, for, for both cohorts. Um, and what we did, though, was um, we had to make the two populations kind of similar in some way because the there was a cutoff score on the MOCA for the healthy control. So this 28 I'm showing you here was for everyone with Parkinson's disease who had a score of 27 or above on the MOCA baseline. It's just a slight subtle um, nuance to how we handle this um, cohort. Um, so we made the two cohorts kind of similar baseline, and we wanted to see how their dementia um, rates were over the same decade. And I'm sorry for this figure being a little bit blurry, but I think you can get the point. Um, what you see is the blue group is, I've already showed you this data, it's about 10% at 10 years. Um, this, this goes out a little further to 12 and a half years, but um, the blue is the Parkinson's, I'm sorry, the blue, the red is the Parkinson's disease and the blue is the healthy controls. So you can see even though the Parkinson's patients don't have um, a significant um, dementia rate compared with previous studies, they still are more likely to develop dementia than the healthy controls in their population. So when people say that the Parkinson's group in 
PPMI is atypical. It probably is atypical or is atypical compared with many cohorts, but it's still um, able to, you're still able to detect differences between the, the Parkinson's patients and healthy controls, um, even in this study. All right, so here's some of the strengths and limitations. So some of the strengths of the data I presented you, the new data, is that both studies are current and ongoing um, compared with much of, you know, some of what I showed you before and other studies that were conducted some time ago. They're relatively large compared with previous studies. Um, those studies had approximately 100 or so patients. Here we're talking about 400 in each cohort. We assess patients serially. So those other studies only saw people at very specific time points, like every five years or four years. Here we're seeing them every year or every other year, so much more frequently. We administer both global and detailed cognitive assessments across multiple domains. So other studies may have had much more limited cognitive batteries than what I'm presenting today. Um, we have a site investigator or a consensus process to assign a cognitive diagnosis at each study visit. So I feel like our diagnoses are pretty accurate, whereas other studies have used other ways of um, um, diagnosing dementia that I would have less confidence in. Um, and finally, one advantage is of the PPMI study is that it's multi-site um, and international. So increasingly international, but um, at least multi-site. There was 20 plus sites um, for the data that I was showing you before. What are some of the limitations? Um, for the PPMI study, there is some missing data in outlying years. So the, sim the sample size gets smaller as you get out closer to 10 years. Um, and that was in large part due to the COVID pandemic um, causing people to miss visits or maybe even drop out of the study during the latter half of the decade that I was presenting. Um, for PPMI, there's a reliance on the site investigator to diagnose dementia without requiring consideration of cognitive test results. So I'd say the site investigator diagnosis for PPMI is less rigorous than our consensus diagnosis for the PEN cohort. And then finally, this gets to the atypical nature, particularly for PPMI. Um, both cohorts are relatively young at disease onset, so low 60s on average, highly educated, 16 years of education on average. So we're talking about college graduates typically, highly motivated to participate in these studies. They're, these are studies that are demanding um, from, um, from a participation standpoint. Um, they're overwhelmingly white, so they're not um, generalizable in terms of race and ethnicity and um, were recruited specifically for participation in a research study. So for all of those reasons, you would expect that we would be underestimating dementia compared with um, Parkinson's disease patients at large or in general. So conclusions, and I, this is the last slide to present, um, results from two large ongoing prospective studies PPMI and PEN suggest that dementia in PD occurs less frequently or at least later in the disease course than off-cited previous research studies have reported. Um, and again, I want to highlight that as you get into 20 years from diagnosis, um, you're often talking about patients in their you know mid-80s. We must also remember that dementia is increasingly common in the general population as people age. Um, we found that increasing age disease diagnosis, male sex, and lower education predicted development of dementia in Parkinson's, and that is um, consistent with previous literature. So that shows that this study was not an outlier in that. These studies are not outliers in that regard. Um, this is not surprising, as increasing age is also associated with an increased likelihood of comorbid Alzheimer's disease and vascular disease, both of which are associated with cognitive impairment in Parkinson's disease. So you're, having Parkinson's disease doesn't make you immune to these other things. And I guess, you know, an important concluding um, statement to make, I think, is that this suggests a longer window to intervene to prevent or delay cognitive decline. Um, so I think this hopefully will um, encourage people who are developing treatment or doing preclinical research or clinical research studies um, to look early, but also to remember that even in those who have been diagnosed with Parkinson's, there's still, you know, a window um, to develop treatments um, that hopefully, you know, improve the function and quality of life of people with the disease. 
So that is the end. I will now I'm going to stop sharing and hopefully, yes, I'll get back to the screen that was on before. Thank you so much. So we do have some questions and I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to spotlight you so that people can see you easily. So um, I'm going to start off with someone wanted to know if you could um, explain a little bit more about how mild cognitive impairment versus dementia is differentiated. Right. Thank you. And I, that was in my mind and it left in my mind. It wasn't a part of the, oh, the slides. Um, so if I just use those three common categories that I mentioned before, because that's easiest to use those, um, normal cognition, MCI, and dementia. So normal cognition typically means a person is not identified or no one who knows the person well has identified any significant decline or meaningful decline from their baseline from before Parkinson's, let's say. Um, they test normally on cognitive testing, whatever that testing is, and that their function, their cognitive function, which means your ability to do day-to-day -day activities that involves cognition, paying bills, managing medications, going shopping and preparing meals, whatever it might be, is intact. Mild cognitive impairment means that typically somebody has noticed some change. When objective testing, there are some deficits um, identified either deficits compared with how they used to be or deficits compared with the general population. But the impairments are not so significant that the person is impaired in their ability to function day to day. And then dementia would be changes in cognition over time, more significant, um, meaningful differences um, or, or decline on cognitive testing and some impairment in functioning. So it's having a clinically meaningful or significant impact on day-to-day -day functioning. That's really what separates a mild cognitive impairment from a dementia diagnosis. These are subtleties and gray areas, but that, that's te um, technically how it's done. So we just had a question, I think goes with what you were saying. Did you find factors that increase the risk or rate of cognitive decline? Um, well, just the three that we examined, um, clinical, there's clinical factors, demographic factors, and biological factors that can be studied. We weren't looking at biology at all in the study. So the clinical and demographic factors, um, the demographic factors are what we really looked at here, which would be age, sex, and education. So those I reported already. Um, clinical factors might be, for instance, uh, Parkinson's subtype called the postural instability gait disturbance subtype versus the tremor dominant has been associated more with um, um, de uh, cognitive decline in Parkinson's, but we didn't um, look at that specifically in, in this study. Right, and then there was a question, um, did the studies, either of them, take into consideration the physical activity of participants? And do the studies indicate that once someone has some cognitive decline that it automatically progresses or can you stabilize it with behavioral changes, mm -hmm. lifestyle changes? So the easy answer or simple answer is that we didn't look at that. And I would say neither of the studies have great variables about exercise, but I will say there's a lot of interest in diet and exercise, diet meaning what you eat, not trying to lose weight um, specifically, but um, in terms of diet, exercise, um, co exercise can be physical exercise, it could be cognitive exercise. There's a lot of interest in that, a lot of studies that are ongoing. I'd say it's kind of inconclusive evidence in terms of whether it makes a difference in the short or the long term. Um, but we didn't specifically examine that in in this um, in these analyses. And another question, so these are really interesting. So um, you mentioned high intellect um, mm -hmm. with the lower risk. But for those who might have high intellect but still experience some cognitive changes, do you find that those with high intellect have the ability to, compensate? Do mm -hmm. they have a higher ability to compensate because of that cognitive reserve? And if so, to what degree? Yeah, so that's a good question without an easy answer. I mean, there, there's like two facets to that maybe. One is, does having higher education in this case 
Um, because that's specifically we looked at just education, not intellect in other ways, um, at just education level. Is it actually protective? Does it does it mean that if you get Parkinson's disease at the same age as someone else who has lower education, that 10 years or 20 years down the road, you're less likely to have um, dementia? Or does it just mean you're starting from a higher level and that even though you may decline the same amount as somebody else, the fact that you started at a higher level means you decline from a superior range to an average range as opposed to an average range to a below average range. And I don't think we really know that for sure, but I think there is clearly from a statistical standpoint, if you're just looking at test scores, if you're at a superior level and you experience a decline, you may only decline into an average level, which means you may you may be able to function similarly to other people in the average level, even though it represents a decline for you. And then there's a question, um, have you found any correlation between bipolar disorder in Parkinson's, especially in regards to dementia, but also with executive functioning, or I will add to that any other um, similar diagnoses. Mm -hmm. There has been some research on um, bipolar disorder um, and Parkinson's recently. It's kind of more large epidemiological studies, maybe showing some association. It's really looking for whether a pre-existing bipolar disorder, which typically has its own set in young adulthood or midlife, depending on whether you're talking about males or females or what type of bipolar disorder. Um, but I must say my clinical experience, which is pretty extensive after 20 years, is that seeing true bipolar disorder, like pre-existing in the context of Parkinson's disease has been very unusual in my experience. I mean, I can count on one hand how many true bipolar patients I've seen. doesn't mean it doesn't happen, but it's just, I've been struck that it's not common. Um, in terms of other psychiatric disorders, um, depression, there's some evidence may um, predict or be associated with um, more cognitive decline over time than um, people who don't experience depression in Parkinson's. Um, I'd say the strongest correlates um, of not other psychiatric type disorders and cognitive impairment are psychosis, so people that experience hallucinations and delusions. That's strongly correlated with cognitive impairment and Parkinson's. And that sleep disorder I mentioned, um, rapid eye movement, sleep behavior disorder, people that have that versus those that don't tend to have more cognitive changes over time. Well, since you mentioned the sleep disorder, there was a question in relationship to sleep apnea mm -hmm. and whether that has been looked at as maybe a correlate. Yeah, that's two good ones, two good questions. I mean, not in terms of um, long-term cognitive decline, but in terms of things that may be actionable, so ways to improve cognition or treat cognitive changes. There's evidence that both um, obstructive sleep apnea, that's one, and orthostatic hypotension, so that's where your blood pressure drops going from a sitting to a standing position, both of which um, are associated with kind of acute cognitive changes. And by that, I mean, there've been some studies, they're not um, universally the same or um, consistent, I should say, but some studies have shown that people who have obstructive sleep apnea and wear a CPAP for instance, that's one treatment, um, continuous positive airway pressure machine versus those that don't wear it tend to do better cognitively, maybe because they're sleeping better, they're less fatigued the next day, for instance. And there's also evidence that people with orthostatic hypotension, when they experience that drop in blood pressure, if you test them cognitively while they're sitting and then while they're standing and their blood pressure goes down, they perform worse while they're standing. So it shows that maybe they're not getting enough blood to their brain. So those are the kinds of um, practical things that might be considered. Um, they're not really like treatments to prevent cognitive decline over time, but in um, they may be in a management um, of actually acute um, cognitive symptoms. Well, I think it goes towards one of the questions that came in earlier about, you know, moving towards more emphasis on how to best acknowledge or treat the non-motor symptoms um, that go along with progression. And, you know, several of those, which you just spoke of. Right. I agree. And then there was a question that came in earlier also um, related to prodromal constipation and dementia. And they 
they asked it because this question came from a statement in the first Lancet article you had mentioned about the prodromal constipation. So they wanted to know about that associated with Lewy body disease. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure of a direct link between constipation and cognition specifically, but certainly constipation is one of those autonomic signs, as we call it, autonomic nervous system, um, that is a clear prodromal symptom for Parkinson's. So people who have constipation in midlife, particularly significant constipation, are more likely to develop Parkinson's disease than people without constipation. So it doesn't, I mean, it doesn't mean you're going to have it, but it does seem to be associated with it. So just like impaired smell is associated to some extent with development of Parkinson's, so is constipation. I'm not aware of a more direct link with cognition though. Um, one of the questions came in is, in, in your research, do you take into account that some people with PD may appear different when they're around researchers than they are at home? And does your instruments account for that? Um, well, good point. Um, I'd say no, it doesn't account for it. It's interesting, though, that most of our visits now are done, um, at people's homes since the pandemic, um, everything got scrambled um, because we weren't able to bring people in to our clinic in the same way. So we started doing home visits and I'd say almost all of our visits now are done either at home or virtually by computer even. But I do think there can be an effect of um, test anxiety that can impair performance. Um, and I don't know that we have a great way to account for that or control for that. I'd say even more significant in Parkinson's, and this is certainly true, and we have research to suggest this or to demonstrate this, is that there's just a lot of variability in performance in Parkinson's. So what we found during the pandemic, we were trying to validate virtual testing. So we wanted to know if you tested somebody close in time, a couple of days apart in this case, but you did one of them in person and one of them virtually, would you get the same test results? And what we found from that study was that it didn't matter whether you did it virtually or in person, it was about the same. But what mattered was just that you were testing people at two different time points. So we found that um, cognition varied. Um, so you could give somebody a MOCA test one day and get a certain score. And if you gave that exact same MOCA test three days later, you might get quite a different score. And I think anybody with Parkinson's or many people with Parkinson's disease can identify with that. Some days are good, some are bad, some parts of a day are better than others. It may depend on your medication, it may depend on any number of other variables, but that, that's what we have more trouble accounting for or controlling for. I understand that. And I imagine that the question I just asked about being different um, in front of a researcher versus in front of just their loved ones at home is, I know some people have talked about that phenomenon that they show up, you know, they put on a show that they're really use a lot of, I guess, the cognitive physical reserves to appear maybe better um, than what is seen day to day at home. And I guess that could be part of what you were just speaking of. Some of that variability could be how they feel that day, medications, all of those things, but they got a good night's sleep. Yeah, I think that's true. And maybe one promising thing in that regard is um, more and more we're starting to at least pilot test and maybe incorporate um, computerized testing and cognitive testing I'm talking about. And some of these platforms um, allow people to self-administer. So I think more and more we'll have people being able to test themselves, complete the testing at home without a doctor or rater present. And we'll be able to test people um, at multiple time points more easily. It's hard for us to bring somebody in person every day. But if somebody's just doing something on a computer for 10 minutes, they can do something like that pretty frequently. And then you get more um, time points, which is much more valuable than just having one time point a year. So there is a question. Um... Do you recommend a person who has cognitive issues and anything specific that they can do to help? Um, and what part does um, maybe even increasing their carbon double levodopa play? Mm -hmm. I'd say there's no evidence that increasing Parkinson's medications is helpful for cognition. If anything, some of them probably are more likely to be 
harmful just because they can lead to I don't know, subtle cognitive slowing or confusion at higher doses. So if anything, Parkinson's medications are decreased over time, if possible, not increased if somebody has cognitive impairment. Um, in terms of other things to be done, so a clinician can evaluate whether they think any of the available medications we have, the most commonly used class would be a cholinesterase inhibitor, which are approved for Alzheimer's disease and one of them approved for Parkinson's disease is appropriate for use. We typically reserve that for more significant cognitive impairment. Um, we talk about things such as exercise, um, diet. Um, we talk about managing medications, so not just Parkinson's medications, but other medications that may have properties such as um, what we call anticholinergic properties that may um, affect memory and attention. Um, we talk about managing vascular risk factors. Um, so anyone who has diabetes, high blood pressure, hypercholesterolemia, obesity. Um, those are things that can, if can be managed, may help with cognition over time. Um, we talk about these some of these other things that I mentioned, um, obstructive sleep apnea, orthostatic hypotension. So while we're waiting for newer treatments to come out to be tested, hopefully it's shown to be helpful, th those are the additional steps that we can take at this point in time. Kind of along that line, um, for someone who may not be yet experiencing mild cognitive impairment or maybe just at the very early stages of that, um, is there any benefits to like brain games, other cognitive stimulation? And there was even a question about, you know, <laughs> getting more education. Like, is there a point where, you know, um, it's too late for that? I don't think we know the answer to any of those questions. And um, so I, I recommend those things, but I also tell people um, I, I'm not recommending it because I think there's solid evidence that it's going to make a difference down the road. I recommend it because I think it's not harmful and it may be helpful. We'll find out over time. And I think it's often enjoyable for people and um, either the activities themselves or people feel like they're doing something on their behalf. And then things like exercise, I think, are just good in general, probably maybe good for the Parkinson's symptoms if people can work on strength and flexibility and balance. Um, but maybe, I, but I don't think we know if you're on, being honest with people, we just don't know if things like that or if diet are really going to have a meaningful impact on people um, long term. So for instance, what would be another example? Much more work is done in Alzheimer's disease. There's been a lot of focus on the Mediterranean diet. Um, and the DASH diet is one example, but there was just a large study in patients um, that were overweight and elderly um, that went on the DASH diet and it didn't show any benefit on cognition over a long period of time. So it may be good for you to be on a Mediterranean diet, but it, that's different than saying, you know, it's going to have an impact on your cognition long-term. And lastly, is there any um, disease modifying treatments that or in research now that might be in the pipeline? There are. I mean, nothing that's been approved. The, the first synuclein um, immunotherapy studies um, were negative. Um, there's been some recent ones that are positive. As people know, for Alzheimer's disease, there's now been three positive studies, it appears, so three approved medications soon. Um, but we don't have the equivalent for that yet in Parkinson's disease. But additional studies are being done. Um, so we'll just have to see if any of them end up being positive. And I think the, the hope there is that any disease modifying therapy, if it's targeting, let's say, synuclein or what we call Lewy bodies, that should not that should have not only a motor benefit, but it should have a cognitive benefit as well, because the neuropathology of cognitive impairment in Parkinson's disease is related to the underlying Lewy body pathology. So I think anything that's disease modifying should have a benefit, um, hopefully for cognition as well. We just don't have it yet. Okay. And then only only have like two minutes left, but some of these questions are so good. Mm -hmm. So um, this person wanting to know, people may take Miralax for constipation daily, but it's been reported that in people prone to cognitive decline, it may hasten this. Is this true or false? <laughs> I, I don't know. I mean, maybe I'm missing some data, but... Uh, I just, I don't want to say it's not true. I'd have to see an article and review it, but I, I, 
I'm not aware of that, but I don't want to say it's not true. I just haven't heard of it. Awesome. And I agree with Judy Reynolds' um, comment. It's important for all of us to sign up for studies if we're hoping for the cure for these disease-modifying treatments. So um, certainly go on to Fox Trial, Fox Trial Finder or um, uh, Trial uh, Grief uh, Trials. You know the one. What's the one I'm trying to say? The other website. Um, uh, I, I'm not sure the website, but I know that since I'm part of the PPMI study, they're always trying to get people to sign up for the PPMI study through PPMI online or my PPMI, PPMI trials.gov. That's it. Thank you, Kelly Merkel, for saving yeah. me. I, I, my brain just froze, but yes. Yeah, there's, there's clinical trials and observational studies, um, and some are for Parkinson's patients, some are for at-risk Parkinson's patients. So there's lots of opportunities to get involved if people want Fantastic. Well, I want to thank you um, for bringing this information to us. I know this was something that a lot of people are very interested in, obviously very concerned about. And so um, it's nice to hear some hope and some, you know, potential positive news with this, that it may not be as quite as bad as we thought it was. So thank you for that. And just a reminder to everyone, um, this will be up on our website, the recording and the slides. Within a day or so, um, we've dropped a few links in your chat. So if you want to save those to reference those later, just go to your little chat box where the little three buttons are at the bottom and you can click that up and it'll allow you to save your chat. And then just a reminder in case somebody joined after we got started, just the friendly reminder that we are going to be eliminating those day of reminders. I think Kelly just dropped about uh, the a note about that in there, you're still going to get a notification if you already registered. These are for those who haven't already registered. Look for those in your Sunday weekly roundup, and this will be February 1st when we start that. So I want to invite all of you to turn on your screens if you haven't already, because we need to thank Dr. Weintraub for this amazing information and give him our wave of gratitude. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much, right. Dr. Weintraub. Thank you for the invitation and nice seeing everyone. Thank you for attending. Thank you. Take Have care. Have a good rest of the day. Bye.